Shalom, Izzy here with Holy Language Institute at holylanguage.com. Welcome to this second little discussion in our four-part series introducing you to the Mishnah. In this one, we are going to talk about the question of how the Mishnah was developed and why. And I hope you enjoy all of the pictures in of the Mishnah in this series. I love books with pictures, and if you don't love books with pictures, we'll keep some text in here for you also. This, of course, is a uh, newer edition by Art Scroll, wonderful, wonderful publishing company. As you can see, there are lots of it. There are lots of editions of the Mishnah out there. And uh, hopefully that doesn't scare you. So let's talk about the first question. How was the Mishnah developed? Uh, the Mishnah already existed as hundreds of legal decisions and interpretations before the time of Yeshua of Nazareth. Uh, it began to be more systematically arranged under Hallel, who was president of the Sanhedrin and the leading Jewish sage at the time of Yeshua's birth. One of the sayings Halal was most famous for was, Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. Sound familiar? Uh, a rabbi, uh, a generation after Halal, said, Do to others what you would have them do to you. And I guarantee you that when uh, Rabbi Yeshua taught, Do to others as you would have them do to you, people's minds definitely, um, instantly, sprang to the teaching of Halal the sage the generation before, who said, don't do to others what you wouldn't have them do to you. Uh, the Mishnah continued to be transmitted, word of mouth, for another 200 years, roughly, until it was written down under the leadership of Yehuda Hanasi, so that's Judah the Prince, in the late 100s. While the core of the Mishnah remained the same, it was flexible, and it did develop over time, as fresh verdicts were reached in response to new legal questions. I open this introduction by saying that Jesus kept the Mishnah. It's important to qualify this by pointing out two things. Uh, firstly, Yeshua didn't keep the Mishnah in its, in its final codified form, but rather as it existed in his time. And of course, there was definitely very strong uh, parallels there, but it wasn't exactly the same. Uh, secondly, there was a small number of specific rulings that Yeshua did take issue with. Interestingly enough, many of these rulings didn't even make it into the final redaction of the Mishnah. Uh, more on that later. Uh, the Mishnah was written in Hebrew. The style of Hebrew it was written in is slightly different than the style the Bible was written in just 500 years earlier. This proves that Hebrew was still a living language in Yeshua's time, and it disproves the urban legend that Hebrew wasn't spoken in the Second Temple era. If you've ever heard it said, well, Jesus spoke Aramaic, he didn't speak Hebrew. Well, that's not actually true. He spoke both. Now, this style of Hebrew is usually called Mishnaic Hebrew in English. Uh, in Judaism, it's either called by the Aramaic term Lishna de Rabbanan, so that means the language of our rabbis, or by the Hebrew term Lashon Chachamim, the language of the sages. Now, this is, a, again, an interesting parallel between Aramaic and Hebrew. In Hebrew, we say lashon, which literally means your tongue. And uh, in, in Hebrew, that represents language. The tongue represents language. So, you know, when someone is speaking in tongues, they're speaking in a language kind of idea. And, um, and then, so the Aramaic is lishna. So you can see the parallel between lashon and lishna. Okay, and then in Aramaic, the term rabbanon is used, our rabbis or our teachers. And then in Hebrew, it's the chachamim. So a chacham is a wise person, like a sage. And then Lashon HaChachamim is the language of the sages. So, Lishna could be a pretty name, but unfortunately, it's not the name of your next date. And uh, similarly, Lashon, as far as I know, isn't a guy. Although, it's kind of a cool sounding name. After the Mishnah was put into writing, uh, commentaries on the Mishnah were written down for another 300 years, uh, mostly in Aramaic. These commentaries were called the Gemara, which comes from the verb gemar, to complete or finish. So basically, the Mishnah is in Hebrew, and then the Gemara, which is the commentary on the Mishnah, is uh, mostly in Aramaic. 
Maybe that'll help you to remember the word Gemara. It sounds like grandma, a little teeny tiny bit. Uh, now, the Mishnah and the Gemara together are called the Talmud. Um, Talmud means study and comes from the verb Lamad, to learn. Uh, Lamad is also the root of Talmid, the Hebrew word for disciple. Here's an example of a page from, excuse me, the Talmud. And uh, there are different sections. So as you can see, this, uh, this section here is the actual text of the Mishnah. This section here is the commentary on the Mishnah, that is to say the Gemara. And then there are also various um, rabbinic commentaries surrounding that. Nice layout. And here are a couple more examples for you. You can see here it says Talmud Bavli. So that means um, there basically there were two Talmuds that developed. One was in the land of Israel, which is referred to as the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. And then the other is referred to as the Talmud Bavli, which developed in the land of Bavel or Babylonia or ba Babylon, which is called the Babylonian Talmud. Now, you could say that basically the Mishnah is commentary on the Torah and the Gemara is commentary on the commentary. And uh, hopefully your heart doesn't melt to hear that if you haven't even read through the Bible yet. The scripture is king and uh, if you f stay focused on that, you'll, it's a, you're off to a great start. Now, your so your big takeaway here is that the Mishnah started out oral and developed over hundreds of years before finally being written down. And your bonus takeaway is that that stuff about Hebrew being a dead language in the time of Jesus, that's an urban legend. <laughs> it does beg the question of why we call it the oral law or the oral Torah when it's actually uh, in writing. And uh, that thing about Hebrew being a dead language in the time of Jesus is urban. It's an urban myth. It's urban Mishnah. All right, let's, uh, let's continue now and talk about why. Why was the Mishnah developed? To understand the reason for the Mishnah, you need to understand four things about the Torah. Uh, firstly, the Torah was given as compulsory civil law. It wasn't given as optional religious law. It, it's almost impossible for us to grasp this concept because we live in a secular society that practices the separation of church and state unless we live in Saudi Arabia or um, Iran, in which case we couldn't say this. It's, a, it's quite a concept. You know, next time you're reading the Pentateuch, remember this stuff was actually given as mandatory federal law to the nation of Israel. Now, secondly, the Torah was given to a community, not to individuals. Now, this is another concept that's extremely difficult for us to wrap our minds around because Western society and Protestant Christianity are both highly individualistic. So this concept that the Torah wasn't given to individuals, it was given to a community, you really need to stop and, and let that sink in. It's a, an amazing thought for some of us to realize that there's something greater than me as an individual. Or to think about... Um, the, the community of, of the people of God, whether that be the church or the nation of Israel, to think of that as an us rather than a me. And if you've ever, for instance, if you've ever gone church shopping, you may, you may know what I'm talking about. You can't do the one another commandments, like love one another, for instance, by yourself. Unless you're grumpy cat. So thirdly, the Torah gives general instructions but it leaves out the practical details. It is literally impossible to keep the commandments without fleshing them out with traditions. So if anyone claims to be, you know, written Torah only, Bible only, none of those traditions of men, that's actually impossible. You, you literally cannot do that. One example of this third dynamic would be how the Torah commands Israel to live in sukkahs for seven days. You know, that's like a booth, but doesn't actually define what a sukkah is. Uh, not surprisingly, there's an entire tractate in the Mishnah dedicated to this question, named, wait for it, Sukha. You probably cheated and read ahead, didn't you? <clears throat> so, next time someone says I only go by the Torah, 
you say, well, what's a Sukkot? You, like, really? You, they're, they're, the Torah doesn't define Sukkot at all. Another example, uh, maybe a Sukkot is an umbrella. You know, maybe it should be the festival of umbrellas. I'm just kidding. But that's an example. I mean, you can make up all kinds of things. Another example would be how the Torah requires farmers to leave the corners of their fields for the poor to glean, but doesn't specify a minimum quantity. Legal questions relating to laws such as this are tackled in the second tractate of the Mishnah, Peyot. So, you know, technically someone could get away with leaving like three stalks of wheat in the corner of their field. And they'd say, well, I did. I left the corner. <laughs> uh, that doesn't work. You know, when, when the Torah is... Um, the federal law of the land, when it's a, when, you know, it's mandatory law, then you need to have some definitions here. Uh, fourthly, and finally, the Torah was given with an explicitly stated expectation that legal questions would arise which the written Torah doesn't clearly address, and that these questions would need to be decided by nationally recognized judges. The Torah is clear in stating that the decisions made by these judges would be binding and authoritative. So, this approach to the Torah, every every person doing what's right in their own eyes, that's not actually a good thing. And the Torah does not leave room for that either. So, we're going to read this entire passage uh, uh, you know, where, where the Torah talks about this. And I want you to notice these two things for yourself. Notice how the written Torah needed to be interpreted and applied in specific situations. And notice how the written Torah required judges with legally binding authority to do this. So this is in, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, and you will see the reference at the end. If any case is too difficult for you to decide, then what do you do? Let's say you know different different lawsuits. List some of them. Cases of disputes in your dispute in your courts arise. Go up to the place which Adonai your God chooses. Come to the Levitical priest or the judge who is in office in this, those days. So, in other words, it doesn't only have to be the um, the priests and the Levites who do this. It can be uh, any 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 judge in the nation of Israel who is in office. And you shall inquire of them, and they will declare to you the verdict in the case. So, you know, if the written Torah was sufficient, you wouldn't have to do this because everything would be clear, and you can just go by the book. But there are cases, there are questions where the written Torah isn't it isn't isn't clear enough. And so in those cases, you need to go up to the, um, to the judge and ask them about it, and they'll give you a verdict. And it goes on to speak, say very quite clearly that you need to um, do, you know, you, according to the terms of the verdict, which they declare to you from that place, uh, be careful to observe. So again, these judges, um, this, their, their rulings weren't optional. They were, um, they were compulsory, so to speak. And uh, their decisions were backed by um, by the, the power of the legal system. And this is in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Now, having read that, as I pointed out, it's very important to understand that in Yeshua's time, and in the centuries followed, those following those judges, the judges who were in office in those days, were the rabbis quoted in the Mishnah. Now, it's a relatively common belief, from what I've seen, that those evil rabbis threw their additions into the Torah, and out came this Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is just a bunch of uh, um, a bunch of uh, additions to the Torah, and just adding to the law. The Mishnah is all about adding to the law, and it's just this big party that those evil rabbis had, just you know, getting their jollies from making up more laws to make people's lives worse. Um, hopefully, you've come to see from this discussion that the development of the Mishnah was a far cry from adding to the Torah, and that it would be more accurate to say that the Mishnah is an extension of the Torah. It's a fleshing out of it, uh, not unlike the New Testament, actually. And that would be one example of how the Mishnah and the New Testament are similar. Both the Mishnah and the New Testament are an extension of the Torah. They're, they're built upon the foundation of the law of God, as communicated through his prophet Moses, and um, they are a fleshing out of the previous uh, divine revelation in Scripture. So hopefully, you've been able to see that the Jewish people literally couldn't keep the Torah without developing the Mishnah, because the Torah is compulsory civil law given to a community requiring traditions in an ongoing authoritative legal system. And it's wonderful that it is your, you know, your own personal Torah. 
But at the same time, you have to realize that it is more than just about you as an individual. Uh, you may not agree with all the decisions in the Mishnah, and that's okay. Uh, the sages didn't agree with each other either. And as we'll soon see, neither did our Master Yeshua. Uh, what's important is that you understand the need for some sort of Mishnah, that you respect the process through which these decisions were made, and that you remember that the Torah wasn't given to you. It was given to the Jewish community. And more on that last point later. So your big takeaway here is that we need the Mishnah. And uh, you may want to try that sometime as a pickup line and see how that goes. Uh, your bonus takeaway is that the Mishnah wasn't all about adding to the Torah. That's an urban legend. The Torah is not an the, the Mishnah isn't an addition to the Torah. It's an extension of the Torah. That is the intent behind it. So that was uh, part two. In our next discussion, in part three, we are going to talk about our dear Savior. And we're going to talk about the question of what he thought about the Mishnah. And I do hope that you will join me for that discussion, because that's really going to be where the rubber starts to meet the road.